Moin and Gluten Tag. Are you tired of baking frisbees? Let's fix that. In this video, I'll show you my favorite list of seven countermeasures against baking sourdough frisbees. They will help you achieving that beautiful oven spring and that nice looking ear on your sourdough bread. To make things easy, I will show you the process step by step, having one good dough and one bad dough. That way you can more easily spot your own improvement areas. Bye bye frisbees! Countermeasure number one, sourdough starter acidity. We have to make sure that our sourdough starter is not that high in acid. The acidity is coming from the bacterial part of your sourdough starter. That's why it's called sour. Over time, that acid is going to damage the gluten structure and this way your dough pretty much collapses. Imagine tiny balloons inside of your sourdough bread. Those we're trying to inflate. And well, yes, the acid is going to attack them, destroy them, and this means that our dough is not going to rise as much in the oven as we want it to. And for this, I recommend you to have a look at the feeding ratio of your sourdough starter. I always recommend a 1 to 5 to 5 feeding ratio. That will be 10 grams of sourdough starter, 50 grams of water, 50 grams of flour. I like to use a whole wheat flour and I prepare my sourdough starter the night before. And let me show you what that means in practice. To visualize this, I will be making two sourdough starters. I will be making one with a 1 to 5 to 5 ratio and then I will be making another one with a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. I will show you the acidity in the morning. I'm marking both with the rubber band so that I can see how much this starter is growing overnight. Red rubber band, green rubber band. Let's get back in the morning. Those are the two starters in the morning. They look similar, right? But I'll show you how much different they actually are. I got myself the small pH measuring tool and let's have a look at the different pH values to check the acidity of both the starters. 4.1 something and now the more sour starter now you might be thinking this is not that much of a difference but this difference is going to have a major impact over the whole period of the bulk fermentation this brings us to countermeasure number two picking the right amount of water for your flour i will be setting up two dose one which has around 75 percent hydration and one with 90 percent hydration now 75% means 75 grams of water per 100 grams of flour. Bakers call this baker's math, that way they can easily scale up the quantities of bread they want to bake. I will mix both the doughs together and let them auto lease overnight. So that's just flour and water and then that will sit. And at the same time I'm also going to be preparing my sourdough starter. So then in the morning, directly in the morning, I can just mix everything together and start the fermentation process. You might be thinking only 75% water? Well, you can get amazing crumbs too from breads that are not that high in hydration. So yes, if you have issues with frisbees, I definitely recommend you to start a little bit lower, go for something around 65% in hydration. That just makes things so much easier. But just to make things a little more challenging in this video, I'm opting for even a little bit more so that yeah, things work for me, then they should definitely be working for you. Last note, the amount of water really depends on the flour that you have at hand. You can test your flour and for this I made a separate video showing you exactly how to figure out which levels of water are working for your flour and which don't. So please don't just follow blindly a hydration percentage from the internet. This is something you have to figure out for your own flour. And now I'm just going to be setting up my main dose. I'm doing this in the evening. I want everything to auto lease overnight. One of them has 75% hydration and the other one is 90% hydration. After adding the water, you would just want to start stirring with your hands for a little bit. Uh, you don't want to do any strength development. And yes, the left hand dough already feels so much stickier than the right hand dough. Then I'll let this sit overnight and we'll be back in the morning. This is the good dough. 
nice beautiful window pane effect after this overnight auto lease. I can stretch it quite a lot before it starts to tear. Perfect. And now the dough at roughly 90% hydration. No, oh, also not too bad window pane effect. But when touching this dough, it just tears so much faster. So this is a little bit of a lost cause working with a dough like this. You could probably you could probably do this, but it would require really a lot of expertise and a lot of skill. You would need to have excellent technique. So I would say this is even a little bit too much hydration. This is nothing I would recommend you to do, especially if you just get started with sourdough baking. The other dough is going to be so much easier. So. Just to have a fair comparison, I'm going to be adding a little bit of flour. This is definitely something that you can do. And then we have the same base hydration on both the doughs. This brings us to countermeasure number three, excellent dough strength. I will be showing you the same dough again, once with good strength development and one dough without strength development. On both the doughs, I'm using 20% sourdough starter calculated on the flour mass. This is what I like to do when I have time during the day. When I'm doing an overnight bread, I like to go for a little bit less, five to 10% roughly. Next up, I'm going to be incorporating this with my hands for around five minutes. There's not really a technique. You can do everything you like. It's going to be sticky, that's for sure. I just like to rotate like this, stretch and fold. And yes, I will be doing this for roughly five minutes on both of those. The one where I added additional flour could eventually take a few minutes longer, but that's pretty much the technique. You will see that your dough tears here a little bit with the starter added. That's completely normal, nothing to worry about. You might be thinking this destroys my beautiful auto lease. Yes, it does a little bit. However, the auto lease was also mostly about breaking down the flour. And that's something that still happened. The flour is now much easier to ferment for your sourdough. So just keep going like this. You see it starts to stick with my hand. And yes, five minutes roughly on both the doughs. Just to specify one more time, I'm doing this until I see that the sourdough has been incorporated even everywhere. So this is already looking quite good here. But if you look here, for instance, then there are still some patches of sourdough where I see, okay, I need to knead a little bit more. This is not really about adding strength. We will be adding strength in a little bit after. I took the measurement, it's been exactly three minutes. What I like to do is I just like to round this dough up a little bit. That's going to make it easier. Now with my hand at around a 45 de degree angle, I'm just pushing below the dough and I'm rounding it up. I'm using the tension of the pot. This is a good thing to practice because your dough is very likely as sticky as mine is right now. Uh, and you need this for later stages. So give this a shot, great way to practice. This is going to rest for 15, one five minutes, and then we will be back. I'm just going to prepare, be preparing the other dough now. Ah, uh, what a mess. <laughs> So adding flour seems to be a little bit harder than I thought, than I thought. <laughs> it's a German in me. So let's keep kneading this, just trying to incorporate all the flour. Oh, those hands. <laughs> I'll take the timer again until when I'm done. Nom, 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 nom. Nom, nom, nom. So sticky. I've been kneading this dough for around six minutes by now and it's somewhat coming together but it also just feels so much more sticky on my hands than the other dough. Let me try to also round this up and you can see ah, this is not even possible. It's very likely because I just added the new flour 
and it didn't have the chance to develop that way that well so yeah you see how much i'm struggling with this dough already <laughs> we'll also let this one rest one five minutes and then continue working this dough ah i'm struggling <laughs> i'll just leave it like this for now for strength development, I did the initial kneading and I always do the bench kneading. Sometimes I like to do the lamination, but in this case, for this level of hydration, I feel that it's not required. Just have a look at the two different doughs. Do you see how sticky this one is? Likely when I touch it, it already starts sticking to my hand. And here, look at how smooth the surface is. It also sticks, but not as much. So yeah, this is already a sign that something here might be wrong with this dough. But I will be giving both of them the same amount of bench eating. I will not be adding as much strength on this dough. I will be adding the correct amount of strength on this dough. And I'll show you. For this, it's always good to have some water next to you, some water, and uh, start with wetted hands. That way the dough simply won't stick as much. First up, the proper dough. Remove it from the container by going around it. Then I like to do a few stretch and folds in the container. This is just going to help me to remove the dough from the container. And you can see how the dough starts to lift. It's no longer stuck. Very easy. Place it on your counter. For this step, we're using the tension of the surface and we just go below the dough. We pull it out and we fold it over pull out, fold over. And this only works because we did not use any additional flour. I'm going to be doing this for roughly one to two minutes until I see that the dough stays in this ball shaped figure. And actually it almost does, but just to be sure, because I'm not going to be laminating this, which is another technique, I will just be giving this a little more strength and just note how i'm always taking the dough and i'm folding it over and then i'm touching it down here so that the sticky side sticks to itself this is creating superb amounts of strength strength good morning workout for somebody who doesn't like to do sports like <laughs> and now i just like to round this up a little bit using my hands same thing we did pretty much in the pot at a 45 degree angle going inside rotating this dough and this is when a dough scraper can be handy because then you don't lose that much flour on the surface. It's still relatively sticky, I would say, but I'm just going to let this sit here for five minutes until I take care of the other dough. Same thing again, but at least the window pane is now much more stable than before. So this is looking much better. And I already note how the dough just does not want to let go of the container as much. Same thing again, again, strength development, but not as much. All right, so let me also round this up. And because I did a little less kneading, I didn't tear the surface so much. It doesn't stick as much. But just looking at this dough, this dough is already spreading way faster than this dough. So, I mean, now they're roughly the same size, but this one has been sitting here for five minutes. So, yeah. This dough could require more strength development, but I'm not going to do it now because I wanted to show you how this is going to turn into a cascade of fails. 
And now remember the exercise. We will be rounding this up one more time, and this is going to then this is going to start the bulk fermentation. <laughs> and you see, this is where the dough scraper is handy, but I'm not going to use it today. I'm just doing everything with my hands. Dough number one. Forty-five degree angle, push and pull. We are using the tension of the surface. Yes, and I can already see how this is flattening a little bit more. So this does not have as much strength as this. Now this just simply goes back to uh, the container, uh, to the pot where it will continue bulk fermentation. With gentle hands, take your dough like this and place it in your container. No, I lost a little bit of dough there. Note how the bad dough, the one where I didn't add enough strength already spread like this and compare it to this dough. Also, I'm not so happy with the surface here. It's not so nice and round compared with this dough very smooth surface already. Countermeasure number four. I always have issues with number four. <laughs> bulk fermentation on time. The bulk fermentation process starts the moment you mix in your sourdough starter into your dough. The yeast and the bacteria are starting to ferment your main dough. Now bakers typically do many breads at the same time. That's why they call this bulk fermentation. Now, when is the bulk fermentation stage over? Yeah, that's the hard part about this. Well, now it's complete when your dough doubled in size. This, however, sometimes is a little bit hard to measure, especially if you can't clearly see it in your container. And for this, I always like to extract a small sample and that sample will show me exactly when my bulk fermentation is complete. Just take as much as is required to cover the bottom of the jar. I'm just going to spread that in a little bit, then I'll mark the jar. Same thing here. Don't worry about this. You can just bake this as a nice English muffin with a little bit of butter. Very, very, very delicious. Or you can put it into your discard starter jar. If you bulk ferment for too short, well, then your bread won't be as fluffy as it could be. If you bulk ferment for too long, then you end up with a very, very sticky dough. That's because the acid broke down your gluten structure inside of your dough. So it's all about hitting that sweet spot. Those are the final two samples. You can see that I use a little bit more dough here on the left hand side, but that's not a problem. I'll wait until this double in size. Very interesting. The left hand dough, that's the one where I had the less acidity starter. And the right hand side is the sample where I had the starter, which has more acid. And the left hand starter, sorry, the left hand sample definitely increased in size much more than the right hand sample. So I didn't expect that. I expected the right hand sample to increase in size a little bit faster because yeah, there is more yeast, there's more bacteria inside, but maybe on the right hand sample, it's actually the fact that the bacteria, the acid is preventing the yeast from working. I'm just giving both the doughs another coil fold and the dough just already feels way different. And you can also smell the acidity. And this is going to be the last call fault that I will give the dough. Then I will switch to shaping. Just from a consistency point, this dough feels very, 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 very fluffy already. I would say this dough is actually ready, but the sample is saying something else. So yes, uh, I will just wait a little bit longer. This is the bad dough. I wanted to run into some over fermentation issues here anyways, but just based on how this dough feels, I would now proceed and shape it. So this is why I recommend you to use your hands. You need to develop a little bit of a feeling for the dough that you're making. The samples definitely look ready. The right hand side even increased a little more than the left hand side. 
If you have issues with your dough becoming too sticky towards the end of the bulk fermentation, consider not going for a 100% size increase, but maybe more for something around 75%. I definitely noted that high gluten flours allow for a longer bulk fermentation, and if your flour is not that high in gluten, then it could be better to go for a little bit less. But as always, you always have to experiment. This brings us to countermeasure number five, a good shaping technique. Yes, shaping is hard. I'm also still struggling with it. This is where everything comes together. Shaping is important because we give our dough that structure. We pretty much glue our dough together. You want to hit that sweet spot between shaping very tight and shaping not too tight. If you shape too tight, chances are that your dough might tear. If that happens, just let your dough sit for 15 minutes and then try again. Shaping also evens out the crumb a little bit, so you also don't want to be too drastic on your shaping because then you'll have a very, very even crumb. If you don't shape too tight, your dough does not hold together that well. And this means your dough can't expand that much in the oven. Now, if you're looking for that airy crumb, then a not too tight shaping is advised. However, the tighter you shape, the more oven spring you have. So again, it's all about hitting that sweet spot. If you ferment it on time, then this is possible. If you over ferment it, then your dough might now be overly sticky. Whatever you do, it's not going to get better. You have to use more and more flour. Yeah, just give up, use a loaf pan, toss that in, and you're done. Let me show you a good dough and a bad dough again. Let's proceed and start shaping the good dough. Using wetted hands, I will take this dough and place it on my surface. Now it's not ready to be shaped yet because it doesn't have a good shape. You can see it's not very round here. So I will be pre-shaping and I will just be doing that using my hands at a 45 degree angle and pushing around this dough. And now I'm using the tension of the surface to round up the dough a little bit. And that's it. That's all the pre-shaping that we need. I will let that sit a little bit for the gluten to relax and then I will continue with the actual shaping. If you're the kind of person that has issues with sticky dough, I recommend a banneton like this using a linen. This just absorbs so much excess humidity and makes sure your bread doesn't stick. The worst thing that could happen now is, uh, if you're German, you see what I did there. The worst thing that could happen now is that our dough in the end sticks to this banneton. Rice flour for this works excellent. Just sprinkle your banneton with some rice flour. To the good shaping. I'm just sprinkling some flour here on the dough. And a little flour here on the surface. I know this dough is stuck, so I'm flouring my hands to be able to remove it and then I will flip it over. Just like this, no bench scraper needed. Now I'm flattening out the dough a little bit so that this sticky side, this is very sticky, it's becoming a little larger. This makes it easier for me to tuck together the dough. Shaping is pretty much all about gluing the dough together. I will take this side, fold it into the middle, making it stick here on the sticky side. Just like this. And now I will take the other side and I will take the other side and flip it over, make it stick right here. You can do this in multiple iterations. No need to do everything at once. Now we have a roll like this, and now we need to start rolling this up. With floured hands, go inside, roll this over. I'm putting my thumbs here, pushing, thumbs, thumbs, <laughs> inside, rolling this over. I'm starting to notice this sticks a little bit too much, so I'm flouring my hands one more time and I'm using the tension to push into the dough. And now this is pretty much my shaped dough already. I will be covering the edges here. This works easier because I did not use that much flour. A little bit like this, where you're gonna correct this. Same thing from the other side. Just like this, no. Now, if it's hard because you use too much flour, then just add a little bit of more additional water and it should be okay. Now I'm using the tension of the surface to drag the dough a little bit over the surface to round it up and give it some additional tension. Now, the more I do this, 
the more I also even out the crop. So don't do this too much, just a little bit. Because my shaping has been a little bit poor, I noticed some sticky parts here. So what I'm going to do is I will be placing some additional flour. Here, give this a good rub with some additional flour so it does not stick. Now, if you do this and your dough is not too sticky, you actually don't need the linen that much. But just to be safe, this is good. Going in with my hands, flipping the dough over and placing it in the banneton like this. Now, if you didn't use too much flour, you could actually be doing something like some additional uh, stitching inside of the banneton, pulling the edges here and folding them over. A great way to just add a little bit additional strength. I like to use the flour that I have left here on my kitchen counter and just Sprinkle the edges of this dough. Good looking dough. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and just have a look at this utter bad jiggly dough, which I started with too much acid right away. Look at how nice and uh, jiggly this is. Such a smooth dough. But I'm just going to, it hurts me, but I will let this run into over fermentation. This would actually be just perfect now. You see how I can touch this dough? It doesn't stick to my hand. <sighs> uh, what a little bit of a shame to let this go like this. But yeah, we will let this ferment for another two or three hours or so. And I'll show you into what kind of sticky mess this is going to develop. I gave this one another cold hold just because it spread out so much. So that's what I typically do. And this just confirms one more time how important fermentation is. Even after not building all that strength, this dough has inflated so nice and you see how it sticks together. Really, really, really good looking dough. And this is the, <laughs> the dough. Look how puffy it is now. Touching it, it's definitely going to collapse. I'm surprised it actually doesn't feel that sticky. <laughs> I would have expected it to feel even more sticky. Oh no. But now it does, just based, based on how it feels here. Just one quick coil fold to remove it from the container. Mm. And also based on the scent, I can already feel that this is much sour, more sour. Let me try to pre-shape this. Oh, wow, I actually did not expect this to work so well. Uh, but it also starts to tear here. So yeah, I'm just gonna let this sit for a few more minutes and then I will try to shape this dough. Just based on how it feels, it's already feeling more sticky than the other dough, but not as much as I expected, even after, oh no, no, <laughs> okay, I should not have done that, I guess. I will just let this sit here now <laughs> for five minutes and then I'll shape it. So I was out for more than four hours, so it bulk fermented for more than four hours than the other dough. And yeah, you can see here, the surface is now tearing. This is not how it should look like, but we will wait and then shape it. And back to our dough, and you're gonna see me struggle now. I have to use a lot of flour for this dough. Oh, it's so sticky. just won't hold its shape and it starts to stick. No! Need to use more flour. So what I would normally do is I would just take this dough and toss it 
into a loaf pan. <laughs> <laughs> this is not gonna hold the shape at all. <laughs> what an epic fail. <laughs> Uh, so uh, an overproofed like an over fermented dough like this definitely awesome <laughs> does not have to overproof so i'm just going to be placing this in the fridge as well no room temperature proofing then i'll bake both uh, at the same time tomorrow well one after each other countermeasure number six proofing proofing is the stage that starts after shaping i have a full video on this and i'll be linking it right here proofing will inflate that dough that you just shaped with additional gas Imagine a wrinkly balloon and we're now trying to inflate it to the maximum. If we inflate it too much, it's going to burst. If we don't inflate it well enough, then it's just going to stay all wrinkly. So again, it's about finding that sweet spot. An easy way to check whether your dough is done proofing is to use the finger poke test. And here, the finger poke test on this dough, you can just see how quickly this dent is recovering right now. Leave your dough at room temperature and finger poke your dough. There's going to be a dent. If the dent recovers very quickly, then you need to wait a little bit longer. Now, if that dent recovers very, very, very slowly, then your dough is ready to be baked. If the dent doesn't recover at all, then your oven is better heated up. You wanna place that dough in the oven as soon as possible. At room temperature, proofing for me typically takes between one and a half and three hours. A great trick to simplify proofing is to take your dough and just place it in the fridge for at least 16 hours. Again, this also depends on the temperature of your fridge. In my case, it's between 4 degrees Celsius and 6 degrees Celsius. In fact, you could also place your dough in the fridge for a longer period of time, but then you might run into the same issues as with overproofing, you might overproof your dough. The fridge makes it very easy to make the bread baking schedule work with your own schedule. Now you need to ask yourself, when do you want to bake this? What is your schedule? In this case, I want to bake this tomorrow morning, but it's already around 5 p.m. here. I would typically opt for 16 to 24 hours in the fridge, but I want to bake this tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. So this is gonna to be too short. So in this case, I'm opting for around 30 minute proof here at room temperature, which allows the dough to increase in size. And then I will be moving this to my fridge until I'm ready to bake it in the morning. The fridge allows me to slow down the process. At the start, it's still relatively quick, but then it just becomes to a halt almost. Plus I'll have a stiffer dough, which makes it easier for me to score uh, during the baking. So the fridge is a great way, especially if you're in hot environments, to just make sure that the schedule matches your own private schedule. So yes, try 16 hours, then work your way up to 24 hours. You can even do a little bit longer. This is something you have to experiment yourself with. Countermeasure number seven, steam. You need lots and lots of steam during the first half of the bake. If you don't have steam, a crust forms on top of your bread and then your bread is not able to expand anymore in the oven. It tries to find a spot where it's weakest and it's likely on the side, so it's going to expand on the sides. You can achieve this by using a Dutch oven, for instance. Now, if you're a cheap German like me, then you're going to like this method, which I'll be linking right here, pretty much your own Dutch oven with just two trays and a bowl of hot water. And actually, that method made me my most amazing bread so far. Let's finish this up with some more not safe for word Brad footage.
This brings us to the end of this video. If you want to see the full process, including the recipe, I recommend you check out this video. It's my full engineer's guide on baking sourdough bread. It covers everything in detail, including as many scientific explanations as possible. Now I would be very curious to know what's your personal frisbee countermeasure. If you have issues with your dough, please also drop a comment. I'm sure one of you or me is going to be able to help. As always, happy baking and may the gluten be with you.